Outside the Empire vs. Chaos El Clasico, there is perhaps no rivalry more iconic in Warhammer Fantasy Battle than the one that exists between the Dwarfs and the Greenskins, and for good reason. They've been crumping, smashing, roasting, chopping, and grudging each other for millennia, and neither the Green Tide nor the poorly named Everlasting Realm of the Dawi have found a way to eradicate the other species, but not for a lack of trying. Xenocide comes easily to both these races, and with that in mind, Venerus and the Steel Faith Overhaul mod team have plunged into the World's Edge Mountains to give them new ways to wage eternal war against each other and the world at large. The Green and the Grudge has hit the Steam Workshop, and with it, a host of new changes focusing on the Urks, Groby, and Dawi, overhauling campaign mechanics, introducing new ones, adding new units, and generally giving players more to do when they hop into Mortal Empire's campaign and it's been long overdue. In particular, the Greenskins were really suffering. They were one of the first races introduced in the trilogy, obviously, and it was frankly starting to show its age, as their legendary lords and campaign mechanics were falling further and further behind the newer and flashier races. And with this update, SFO has tried to rectify that in a lot of ways. Even for the dwarfs, who got their Runic Forge rework and Ungram Ironfest in the Slayer Keep, had plenty of room to grow and expand on the campaign side of things, and it all starts with the Damaz Kron. The Book of Grudges, which has been completely overhauled. If you're a lore junkie, you'll know that restoring the Kara's Anchor, basically reconnecting lost holds and reclaiming those that fell to the Greenskins and Skaven, is number one on the Dawi agenda. They had tens of thousands of kinsmen crushed under the weight of cavens and invasions as their empire crumbled around them, and many of the most famous Karaks were no longer in their control come the coronation of Emperor Karl Franz in 2502. So as you start your campaign, you've got a whole hell of a lot of legendary grudges to resolve, but doing so will provide you with some impressive map-wide bonuses as well. Remember that painful little affair with the treacherous Elgi that escalated into a continent-spanning war of vengeance? Well, kickstarting that rivalry up again will give you huge bonuses to trade and unit experience at the cost of basically never being able to engage in diplomacy with the High Elves ever again. But who would want to be friends with a bunch of lying knife ears anyway? Reclaim Black Crag from Grimgore, and give the hold its true name again, Karak Draz, and the option to confederate Karak Azul will become available to you. Throughout the Damaz Kron, there are some very interesting grudges now that you can resolve, which is quite a big step up from some of the old ones we had, like Trespassing Greenskin Grudge, which I think is still there, but not the most interesting one overall, right? And it's a great way to immerse yourself in the setting and plan long term like a true Dawi when you've got to right these wrongs that have blasted for the last millennia. There's even one in there for killing Malekith and Dark Elf armies because he lied to Snorri Whitebeard and basically said that those two races would be friends forever. And so getting vengeance for that grudge will be a high priority indeed. Now on top of the Book of Grudges, there has been a huge overhaul of the building tree as well, including the arrival of Ancestor Shrines. These tier 5 buildings can only be built one per province, but have some very powerful map-wide effects. A Shrine to Gazul will protect your dead from necromancers, purging the area of vampiric influence, while a Shrine to Grungni will reduce upkeep of tunnel fighters and increase income from mines. Grimnir, Smednir, and Valea, and a few of the other minor ancestor gods are represented as well. A new unit has also hit the field, wielding the infamous Grudge Raker from Vermintide fame, and this version of Thunders have close quarter shotguns that can blow apart formations with armor piercing, shield shattering, buckshot. Absolutely tiny range of 60, but super high missile damage means if you get a flank off with them and fire into the rear of an enemy formation, they will evaporate. Very satisfying unit to use that can do a lot of damage from close range. And if you're looking for a bit more depth on the campaign map, there's a new economy building tree that requires you to choose between two variants for public order, growth, and income, and you can only choose one of them, each with their own set of strengths and weaknesses. Unlike vanilla, where buildings are pretty much only benefiting you, so you, if you want like the money building, you just build the money building, there are actual downsides to some of these building chains now. So high level mines can introduce Skaven corruption as you delve too greedily and too deep, and high-level industry can lower public order as that crisp cavern air gets overrun by smog. It's at least partially a return to systems like Rome 2 or Attila in previous Total War games where additions to your cities weren't always positive, as squalor or economic malices can have an effect on your building plans overall. And the rune system is probably one of the biggest changes, introducing a true late-game way to customize and tailor units to your own specifications. 
For every unit type in the dwarf roster, you can unlock high level runes to equip on individual units, giving them longer range at the expense of missile damage, or higher attack and charge bonus at the expense of melee defense, or even the rune of demon slaying, which gives units the banished contact effect, expert charge defense, and fear. It needs further fleshing out, honestly. There are a ton of repeats between units, but the idea is super cool and there is a ton of room to experiment and be creative here. Stealth Cloak Gyro Bombers or that kind of stuff could add a ton of flavor and replayability to your late game campaign. Now for the Legendary Lords themselves, Thorgrim Grudgebear gets his Everguard, which are elite hammerers of the Karazak Rack Vaults, and the Slayer King gets his own unique hero, a Legendary Slayer, as well as a retinue of Demon Slayers who were added I think a patch or two ago. There is a massive amount of flavor to be had in Ungram Iron Fist campaign now. I'd venture to guess he's one of the most fleshed out adventures of any character in Mortal Empires at this point. And additions like his second in command, that legendary slayer, are certainly going to help a whole bunch. Look at that stat line for a second, with huge buffs once he falls below 50% HP, large bonus versus large and armor piercing, a leadership and attack aura as he drives nearby allies into a frenzy, in veneration of Grimnir, and a host of other buffs on the battlefield and the campaign map. It's a pretty damn good time to start a Slayer-only campaign. But that's just on the Dwarf side of things. The Green Tide is on the march as well, and they're coming for blood. We know characters like Grimcore were kind of a joke in vanilla, obviously, but well before this patch, things were done to address that problem in SFO. Mechanics like the Juggernaut passive, which increases their mass and reduces their chances of being knocked down, skill tree reworks, stat buffs, the whole works. Unique units like the Immortals, Grimgore's battle-scarred face beaters, made their way into his campaign as well, but there are a lot more changes coming. The Greenskins now have a unique mechanic called the Green Tide, which functions as a faction-wide WA and works alongside many of the same principles as well. It's all about building momentum and carrying that into conquest of your enemy's territory. So basically, when you start the game, you've got a bunch of animosity built up and infighting to deal with. You haven't cemented your reputation as the biggest and meanest war boss in the Badlands, and so you begin with some relatively serious debuffs to growth and your diplomacy with other greenskin tribes. But as you win battles, conquer specific settlements, and expand, your green tide will consistently level up, increasing your fightingness, increasing your ability to gather more waz and more armies to your side, and increasing your income from sacking and raiding, your public order, and massively boosting your recruitment capacity as orcs and gobos flock to your side. Obviously, on the flip side of it, losing battles or settlements to rebellion or enemy factions, as well as sitting around and doing absolutely nothing, will lower that meter, so once you get the ball rolling, you really want to keep it going. You'll also get a series of dilemmas tied specifically to how you improved your green tide, so if you're doing a bunch of agent actions to sneakily subvert opponents, you might get a somewhat morky outlook on things, while outright conquest will be more alongside Gork's preferred outlook. But these dilemmas can do anything from spawning free, unique WAS to granting huge boost to your technology research rate. I haven't experienced it myself, but I have heard that the Green Tide mechanic can bone and scar snick a bit, as his campaign is so vastly different than Azag's, Warzag's, or Grimgore's. I imagine it's kind of hard to balance it perfectly, but because you start at level 1 with some pretty serious debuffs on that Green Tide, I imagine it could hit his campaign pretty bad at the start and punish you really hard if you don't get the ball rolling quick. And Skarsnik isn't exactly known for having a super fast campaign start, so that may need some more looking into. Would love to hear from you guys if you played it so far. Get some feedback on that front and let me know what you think about his campaign in SFO right now. But if you played their vanilla campaign, it was clear their economy was in dire need of some flavor and reworking. And with that in mind, the entire thing has basically been overhauled. They still have settlements, but these now function almost like a horde using population surplus whenever you want to upgrade buildings to tier 2 or higher. The trade-off is that with the exception of their landmarks, their buildings cost almost no gold whatsoever, because at the end of the day, making a huge pile of poop and carving a couple doors and windows in it isn't particularly expensive, which means that most of your money will be spent on recruiting troops and fighting, rather than economy building, which seems pretty appropriate for the greenskins. Just like the dwarfs, they've also received some crazy new buildings. These are the big stuff, Evagies to Gork and Mork, that build their way up to map-wide bonuses at tier 5, unlocking technology, lowering upkeep, and granting bonuses based on their alignment with particular tribes. So there's one chain that focuses on Black Orcs and Big Bosses, another one that focuses on Goblins, and one that pairs best with Savage Orcs. And we can't forget about the new units as well. 
The Black Orc Big Boss is a hero level character who can grow into quite the manimal in frontline combat, exactly what you would expect. He can train allies, grant immune to psychology, get a huge bonus for large or lower the cost of Black Orcs and buff boys whenever they're about to enter the meat grinder. And on the flip side, if you're looking for something a bit murky, the Colossal Squig is a gigantic ball of destruction tailor-made for cycle charging and murdering dwarfs. If you manage to kill it, a bunch of angry squigs will rise up in its place and start running rampage and rush shot all over the battlefield, but honestly, the way it is right now, it should never die, at least not in campaign. Having played a few games with it in multiplayer so far, it's honestly completely ridiculous and overtuned, I think. I mean, it's a blast to use. It's crazy, amazing mobility, tons of damage and charge bonus and all that good stuff. And against heavy cav factions, it's completely killable because you can at least pin it that way. But with its huge mass and crazy speed, there are a lot of races that don't have good answers to it if it's microed well. And if you're looking at that speed value and wondering why it's so ludicrously high, you're not alone, but there is a good reason for it. Apparently, the animations just don't work properly for a squig that big, unless it's also super fast. So for now, I'll chalk it up as a fun unit to mess around with in campaign, but at its current price point and speed of 130, 130, I think it needs some additional balancing, and I'll leave it at that. I don't know exactly what kind of impact the animations have on it when it's going at 100 speed 130 or if it's less than that, but I think that if it lowered its speed a bit, if it didn't mess up the animations too much, that'd probably be how I'd balance it better. In terms of unique campaign effects, Grimgore got a unique trait that lets him recruit a new hero wherever and whenever he wants, representing his calling as the biggest and baddest orc war boss on the planet, that underlings will always flock to his side because he's such a boss, and Azag got a raised dead bound ability tied to his crown of sorcery, which is obviously Nagash's lost crown there, and so just a dash of necromancy to go with the green tide. And he is the only greenskin lord who can recruit feral wyverns. So, if any or all of those changes sound appealing to you, go check out Steel Faith Overhaul on the Mod Workshop, and maybe get a Slayer Only or a Grimgore Wa campaign going, and let me know what you think of all these new additions. Thank you all for watching, hope you guys enjoyed. Indie Pride, signing out for now.